Chapter 22 My dear Wormwood, So, your man is in love, and in the worst kind he could possibly have fallen into, and with a girl who does not even appear in the report you sent me. You may be interested to learn that the little misunderstanding with the secret police which you tried to raise about some unguarded expressions in one of my letters has been tided over. If you were reckoning on that to secure my good offices, you will find yourself mistaken. You shall pay for that, as well as for your other blunders. Meanwhile, I enclose a little booklet just issued on the new House of Correction for Incompetent Tempters. It is profusely illustrated, and you will not find a dull page in it. I have looked up this girl's dossier, and I am horrified by what I find. Not only a, a Christian, but such a Christian. A vile, sneaking, simpering, demure, monosyllabic, mouse-like, watery, insignificant, virginal, bread-and-butter miss. The little fool, she makes me vomit. She stinks and scorns. Scalds through the very pages of the dossier. It drives me mad. The way the world has worsened. We'd have had her in the arena in the old days. That's what her sort is made for. Not that she'd do much good there, either. A two-faced little cheat, I know the sort, who looks as if she'd faint at the sight of blood and then dies with a smile. A cheat every way, and looks as if Butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, and yet, as a satirical wit, the sort of creature who'd find me funny. Filthy, insipid, little prude, and yet ready to fall into this booby's arms like any other breeding animal. And why doesn't the enemy blast her for it, if he's so moonstruck by virginity, instead of looking on there, grinning? He's a hedonist at heart. All those fasts and vigils and stakes and crosses are only a facade or only like mm, foam on the seashore. Out at sea, out in his sea, there is pleasure and more pleasure. He makes no secret of it. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. <clears throat> I don't think he has the least Inkling of that high and austere mystery to which we rise in the miserific vision. He's vulgar, Wormwood. He has a bourgeois mind. He has filled his world full of pleasures. There are things for humans to do all day long without his minding in the least. Sleeping, washing, eating, drinking, making love, playing, praying, working. Everything has to be twisted before it's of any use to us. We fight against cruel disadvantage. Nothing is naturally on our side. Not that that excuses you. I'll settle with you presently. You have always hated me and been insolent when you dared. Then... Of course, he gets to know this woman's family and whole circle. Could you not see that the very house she lives in is one he ought never to have entered? The whole place reeks of that deadly odor. The very gardener, even though he had only been there five years, is beginning to acquire it. Even guests, after a weekend visit, carry some of the smell away with them. The dog and the cat are tainted with it, and the house full of the impenetrable mystery. We are certain it is a matter of first principles that each member of the family must in some way be making capital out of the others. But we can't find out how. They guard as jealously as the enemy himself the secret of what really lies behind this pretense of disinterested love. The whole house and garden is one vast obscenity. 
It bears a sickening resemblance to the description one human writer made of heaven, the regions where there is only life, and therefore all that is not music is silence. Music and silence! How I detest them both! How thankful that we should be that ever since our father entered hell, though longer ago than humans reckon in light years could express, no square inch of infernal space and no moment of infernal time has been surrendered to either of those abominable forces. But all has been occupied by noise, noise, the grand dynamism, the audible expression of all that is exultant, ruthless, and virile, noise, which alone defends us from silly qualms, despairing scruples, and impossible desires. We will make the whole universe a noise in the end. We have already made great strides in this direction as regards the earth. The melodies and silences of heaven will be shouted down in the end. But I admit we are not yet loud enough for anything like it. Research is in progress. Meanwhile, you disgusting little... Here the manuscript breaks off and is resumed in a different hand. In the heat of composition, I find I have inadvertently allowed myself to assume the form of a large centipede. I am accordingly dictating the rest of this to my secretary. Now that the transformation is complete, I recognize it as a periodical phenomenon. Some rumor of it has reached the humans, and a distorted account of it appears in the poet Milton, with the ridiculous addition that such changes of shape are a punishment imposed on us by the enemy. A more modern writer, somebody with a name like Pshaw, has, however, grasped the truth. Transformation proceeds from within, and is a glorious manifestation of that life force which our father would worship if he worshipped anything but himself. In my present form, I feel even more anxious to see you, to unite you to myself in an indissoluble embrace. Signed, Toadpipe, for his abysmal sublimity under secretary screw tape, T-E-B-S, etc.